thank you very much for uh, giving me uh, the opportunity to participate in this uh, the sixth ESRB uh, annual conference. And in some sense, this is uh, closing a circle uh, for me. I had the honor to speak at the first annual conference of the ESRB. And at that time, uh, I did, did so um, in my capacity as chair of the advisory technical committee. And that is a position that I held for uh, six years, starting with the, when ESRB was uh, launched in uh, 2011. Back then, the ESRB as an institution in terms of what it was supposed to be doing and how the work was supposed to be carried out was pretty much a blank uh, page. Uh, over the years, I've been uh, wearing many different hats when it comes to uh, international uh, work. On the one hand, uh, I've been the governor of the Swedish Central Bank for quite, uh, quite some time. But I have also been the chairman of the Basel Committee for Bank Supervision. I have worked for the IMF uh, and I have done many other, uh, have had many other international tasks. And I have also spent quite a number of years uh, working in one form or the other within the ESRB uh, community. Uh, I've been a member of the uh, general board. I've been a member of the steering committee. As I said, I've been chairman of the advisory technical committee and for almost three years i have also been the first vice chair of the esrb board so everything uh, that i'm touching on today and everything that i'm talking about is of course colored uh, by uh, all these different things i've done in the international and the global arena uh, by now uh, for uh, many uh, many years so in that respect uh, having the opportunity to speak to you today is kind of bringing this uh, full circle. Uh, I was uh, with the ESRB at the beginning, and since I'm stepping down as governor uh, and also, of course, then as uh, vice chair of the ESRB at the end of this year, that brings me uh, full circle back to where the whole thing uh, started. And everything I'm talking about is also of course, colored by uh, my experience uh, over th these almost um, these many, uh, many years. Now, if we go back to pre, pre the global financial crisis, uh, macro prudential policies and macro prudential measures were largely unheard of. And and there was not really much of a conversation about macroprudential policies because all of it was focusing on microprudential policies in one form or the other and almost always related to individual institutions. Now, uh, after, during the global financial crisis, it became quite clear that it was not enough to just have the focus on financial institutions as such. Uh, there was also a need to keep an eye on the system as a whole and to try to better understand uh, what the system as a whole looks like and what the vulnerabilities uh, are. Now, introducing macroprudential policies after the global uh, financial crisis has been a game changer. But on the other hand, uh, macroprudential policy is still a work in uh, progress. One lesson that was drawn after, after the global financial crisis uh, came as early on as 2009, because then in a report by a high-level group chaired by Jacques de la, la, la Rosier, uh, that group provided an outline uh, for a European response to the global financial crisis. And within that report, you uh, found the first reflections on um, creating the ESRB. And this is also then, of course, what uh, happened. And that was the starting point, And that's why we are still doing what we are doing uh, today. One strand of thought, which was important in creating the ESRB, was to make sure that the ESRB has a very wide uh, membership. So in addition to the other ESAs, the European supervisory agencies that are well known to, to you, the conclusion was that it wouldn't be enough just to do deal with the different parts of the European financial sector. It would be also important to have somebody taking a look at the whole uh, 
sector. And in doing so also included all the other ESAs and other uh, European bodies uh, that are of relevance when it comes to financial stability. For example, uh, the Euro Com European Commission. And one novelty in this context was also uh, including and creating uh, the advisory scientific committee because it was felt that it would be important to get independent advice uh, from uh, academia where uh, from individuals who have expertise in working on and thinking about financial uh, stability uh, issues. Roughly at the same time, uh, similar processes took place in other parts of the world. For example, on the US side, 15 of the world's leading economists produced the so-called Squam Lake uh, report, urging reformers to take a closer look at the system as a whole. At the same time, similar strands of thought emerged on the side uh, of the Financial Stability Board and also the Basel Committee on Financial uh, Financial Supervision. So all in all, many things were going on roughly at the same time, and all of them actually in one form or the other raised the issue. It is important to keep an eye on the system as a whole and not only keeping an eye on individual financial uh, institutions. I do think that uh, the work that we have done and others have done has served us well in the sense that fast forward uh, to the pandemic, which of course was not a financial crisis, uh, but given that when the pandemic started, we really wanted to avoid having the pandemic morphing into a financial crisis. We were actually in a much better position, both at the macro prudential level and at the micro prudential level, understanding what we needed to do in order to deal with the very unusual uh, and strange circumstances that uh, uh, that the pandemic produced. And it's also, I think, a fact, and it's a positive fact, that uh, the pandemic did not uh, produce a financial crisis also. And that, I think, is a pretty good result, given uh, that things were so different after the global financial crisis back in 2000 and, uh, 2008. And I think one reason for that was that the banks and others have more and better capital than in the past. But we were also in a much, much better position to monitor what was going on in the in the system as a whole. But the work is almost never done. And uh, what we knew, now need to focus more on compared to what we have done in the past is to focus on the non-bank se non sector. Uh, I have the impression that a perennial issue is to deal with data gaps. It takes, in some instances, decades to actually fix various data gaps. And we need to be aware of uh, new types of vulnerabilities that always uh, will emerge in one form uh, or uh, the other. Now, at the first annual conference, when I gave my uh, speech then, I uh, sort of argued that uh, at the ESRB table, you need uh, many individuals with different backgrounds and with different uh, competencies. Because in order to fully understand what the system looks like um, in its entirely entirety, you need to have those different competencies at the table. And you need to find ways of making it possible for these individuals with various expertise uh, to talk to each other in such a way that the sum uh, will be uh, more than the different, uh, different uh, uh, parts. Now, that, of course, on the other hand, produced a very large group of individuals, and it also created a quite complex uh, uh, structure. And, and in the early days, I'm pretty sure that many thought that, hmm, a table of this size can never work. Too many people, too many diverse uh, views. But I do think that it actually has worked. And that's because uh, it became clear early on that with the structures that were created, with the methodologies that were created, with the uh, way the meetings were conducted, it actually became possible for all these experts with different backgrounds to come to uh, conclusions. And we also see that very clearly when it comes to the outputs from the ESRB, because over the years, the ESRB has produced a large number of reports. 
participated in many consultation uh, processes, produced many occasional uh, papers, and also the ESRB has produced surprisingly many uh, warnings and uh, recommendations. And I do sense that in the early days, uh, there were those who actually had doubts whether the ESRB would be willing and capable of producing warnings and recommendations. But uh, 10 years after, uh, I, it's uh, clear that uh, the ESRB has been capable of, uh, of doing this. And all of this based on the principle comply or act, act or explain uh, basis. It's also, I think, important to note that many of the warnings and recommendations that I'm uh, referring to have actually been addressed to individual countries. And that, raise, that, and that shows that country-based country analysis and peer pressure is something which is actually quite uh, uh, important. Now, why was it possible to do this? I think that one factor that has played a major role uh, when it comes to getting things done is the governance structure of the ESRB. Because contrary to many other international bodies, uh, when the ESRB reaches a conclusion, it does not necessarily have to be based on consensus. Because at the end of the day, it's possible at the ESRB uh, table to just uh, vote and get on, uh, get on with it. And I think that that is a blueprint for how to do things also in other international uh, fora. Now, what does it take then for macroprudential frameworks to be uh, successful? First of all, the macroprudential authority, uh, both at the EU level and uh, national level, needs a clear political uh, mandate to act. And you also need to have a toolbox that goes hand in hand with that. Second, the mandate needs to be well defined, and you also need to have objectives that are easy easy to understand. And uh, the macroprudential policies should not be used for all sorts of other purposes. Third, macroprudential oversight should also be transparent and accountable, not least uh, in order to prevent inaction bias, which is a perennial issue, both at the EU level and at the national uh, level. And accountability should allow for public uh, scrutiny. Fourth, you need to have the capacity to identify and assess systemic risks. And you also need to understand how to mitigate those uh, risks. And to do that, you need to have the capacity to both identify and assess systemic risks. And that means, of course, that you need to have the analytical tools, you need to have data, and you have to need to have uh, the methodolog methodological capabilities that you uh, need in order to carry out an informed conversation at the ESRB board. And finally, uh, fifth, uh, it is essential uh, that there is independence. Because without independence, you run the risk of having uh, many other lobbying uh, institutions uh, forcing you to do things that are either not in line with your mandate or you are not uh, or forcing you not to fully deal with your uh, mandate. But at the same time, total ind independence is not possible because when you deal with the financial system as a whole, you also need a degree of cooperation because there are many interested parties dealing uh, when it comes to the financial sector. And that means that you need to find reasonable ways of coordinating and discussing with other uh, experts. But having said that, you also need to be aware of a fact of life. And that is that there will always be pressure from the financial industry. And in the short run, there will always also be various political pressures uh, in order to uh, affect the outcomes or in order to ensure that there aren't really any outcomes in the, in the, short, in, in the short run. And that is because part of the work of the ESRB is basically dealing with the perennial issue, uh, making, a, making a distinction between 
doing the right thing now in order to avoid catastrophes down the road compared to doing nothing now, which uh, sometimes is actually uh, easier, and then probably having to deal with a catastrophe at some time in the, in, in the future. And this is where actually independence matters, because without uh, independence, it is just so easy uh, to sit with your arms crossed and look the other way uh, when you should have uh, taken decisions in order to avoid uh, catastrophes in the, in, the, in the future. Now, when the ESRB was created, at the same time, uh, all EU member countries started uh, creating their own uh, macroprudential institutions at the domestic level. This can be done in many different ways. In some, in some cases, and actually I think in most cases, macroprudential policy is handled by the central bank. And that is particularly in those cases where financial supervision is also handled by the central bank. In other cases, uh, when supervision is outside the central bank, macroprudential policies have ended up with the supervisory uh, authority. Regardless of how this is done, and it can be done in many different ways, you also need independence and cooperation in one form or the other at the other at the national uh, national level, and of course also at the national level you have the same type of political pressures that I uh, referred to uh, earlier, and that means that one has to be careful. Uh, when it comes to the institutional uh, setup, and one has to make sure that the institutional setup, whichever form you have chosen, is actually robust and stable uh, over uh, time. Now, when it comes to robustness, it's not surprising at all when we're talking about macroprudential measures. Uh, and let me give you an example. For example, uh, borrow-based tools. Now, borrow-based tools, those tools are basically about saying no. Uh, households or corporates should not be able to borrow beyond a certain amount of money. And if that is the case, it gets uh, dangerous in the financial sector as a whole. One example is the level of debt that is acceptable. Another example is uh, whether to amortize or not amortize or how much uh, to amortize. And my country is no exception when it comes to a long-standing conversation about borrow, borrower-based uh, measures. And here, uh, domestically, there has been pressure on the FSA to relax, for example, the amortization uh, requirements that are currently in place. And it's also, I think, worth worthwhile pointing out that in my national context, the government has the right to veto any proposal to introduce new borrower-based uh, measures. This is just uh, showing that it is a non-trivial issue when it comes to designing the governance structure, structures in such a way that you actually have the capacity and the willingness to say no, because many macroprudential measures are not really all that difficult to understand. Somebody has to have the right to say not beyond this, whatever that happens uh, to be. Now, in order to get to that point, let me compare a little bit between macroprudential measures and monetary policy. When it comes to monetary policy, independence of the central bank has been discussed for decades. And in an EU context, this is also what is captured in Article 130 of the treaty. And what this really means that uh, today, after decades of conversations and after having independence enshrined in the treaty, it's fairly clear what monetary independence is all about and how central banks go about uh, central banks go about deciding on uh, monetary policy issues. Now, given that macroprudential policies is much uh, younger uh, than the conversation about central bank independence, uh, I think that it is worthwhile to go through a similar conversation, might take a long time, uh, when it comes to finding solutions along similar lines, uh, when it comes to discussing how things are decided on the macroprudential uh, side. And 
as is obvious when it comes to monetary policy, uh, monetary policy is kept at arm's length uh, from the political system. And I do think that we need something similar when it comes to macro, uh, uh, macro prudential uh, policies. At the same time, uh, I would like to argue that it's obvious that there are strong complementarities between monetary policy and macro, macro prudential policies, because both of them are in one way or the other dealing with the price of money, and both of them are um, designing policies within the financial sector as, as, uh, as such. At the same time, as I already alluded to, uh, you need to understand what is going on in the economy as a whole. And that means that also from time to time, the design of fiscal policies uh, will uh, make a difference when it comes to financial stability issues and what macroprudential policies are expected uh, to uh, look like. And a good case uh, is presently uh, what happened during the pandemic, because then it was obvious that both monetary policy macroprudential policies and uh, fiscal policy, all of them were uh, kind of um, moving in the same direction in order to ensure that the wheels kept turning uh, when uh, economies were shutting down in different different forms all over the uh, all over the uh, world. Now, when it comes to the institu institutional setup, I'm convinced that the debate will probably go on forever. But let me at the same time uh, point out that uh, in a report by the ESRB's advisory scientific uh, committee, they basically concluded that uh, in most cases, uh, it's good to ensure that monetary policy and macro prudential policies are closely related. And uh, that speaks in favor of dealing with macro prudential uh, policies uh, within the central bank in one form. Uh, or, or the other. And if that is not the case, then uh, my view is that the central bank, regardless of the institu institutional setup, will be deeply involved in macroprudential policies anyway in one form uh, or the other. I have many times uh, mentioned uh, today that uh, you need to cooperate and you need to coordinate. And that holds at the national level, but it also actually holds at the interna international level because money flows across borders and money flows across borders uh, faster than maybe ever, uh, ever before. And that means that uh, financial stability is nowadays not only a national affair, it is also a European affair and it, it's also a glo global affair. And that means that we need to be able to think beyond our own uh, national uh, borders. And what that means uh, in order to safeguard the EU financial uh, system is that we need to cooperate. Uh, we need to understand various cross-border issues. We need to understand uh, the various uh, financial sectors. And we need to make sure that we have the necessary expertise in order to understand all these issues, both at the pan-European level and at the national uh, level. Some of the challenges are probably with us forever, and but others are uh, new. Now, presently, uh, given that the financial sector is probably more interconnected than before, we need to better understand, and I alluded to this uh, before, we need to better understand what is happening in a rapidly growing uh, non-bank uh, financial sector. And I think that uh, the episode in 2020, uh, which is called the Dash for Cash, and a number of other uh, somewhat similar episodes actually point us in that direction. We need to follow what is happening in the non-bank non -bank, uh, financial sector. And we need to tackle vulnerabilities and we need to deal with the resilience of the non-bank financial institutions. And we also need to better understand what maybe goes under the heading um, market-based uh, finance. What this means is that we're presently faced with many new cross-cutting issues such as uh, climate change, transition risk uh, in the context of climate change, but also completely new fields and completely new fields to many of us, for example, dealing with cyber risks, 
and various types of uh, cyber threats and how to understand the di digitalization process which is going on uh, uh, presently. And at the same time, many financial institutions are challenged today by the fintech sector. And that also means that we need to understand what is happening uh, within the fintech sector. And we also need to come, come to conclusions as to whether the fintech sector actually is not only a fintech sector, it is actually part of the financial sector. And for that reason, should be regulated uh, accordingly. But to do this, uh, we need expertise and we need new types of expertise uh, that we haven't really had in the in the past. But I do think that collectively and together at the ESRB table, we can bring uh, the, these new types of expertise that we need to bear on how to deal with these issues in the in the future. So <clears throat> let me sum up uh, very uh, brief briefly. I'm very, very glad to see how much has been uh, achieved during the little bit more than 10 year period that I have been involved in this type of work. But it's not enough to just settle down and say say that many things have been achieved. We still have plenty of more work to do uh, when it comes to expanding the macro prudential framework uh, to non-banks. We need to bridge data gaps and we need to develop methodologies and new uh, macro prudential tools. And let me just mention uh, one area among many uh, where we have some uh, homework to do. We have made significant progress when it comes to stress testing. But the stress testing that we have done so far has basically mostly dealt with the banking sector only. But within that field, when it comes to stress testing, we also over time need to get better at and we need to be able to include climate related risks and uh, cyber uh, threats. At the same time, we also need to broaden our horizon when it comes to conducting stress testing so that we uh, also will be able in the future to deal with the non-bank sector in a better way than uh, what we have been doing uh, in, the, in the past. Some old problems are likely to re-emerge again because very often when things go wrong in the financial sector, it is because somewhere in the system it has been possible to quietly create too much leverage and then all of a sudden uh, an over levered financial sector comes to the fore we're taken by surprise and things uh, blow up and we need to ensure that we understand what is going on in the system as a whole so that we are not taken by uh, surprise uh, that the ESRB has been able to get things done is not only an issue of hard work. Uh, one important aspect of getting things done is uh, the governance structure of the ESRB, as I uh, alluded to or also earlier, and the fact that at the end of the day, it is actually possible to vote. Uh, a majority decision is being taken, and then you just take it from there and uh, get uh, on with it. Now, when it comes to the future, let me mention one aspect of uh, continuing the work of the ESRB. Since 1999, the International Monetary Fund has been operating, operating what is called the Financial Sector Assessment Program, the FSAPS. This is a very comprehensive assessment of the financial uh, sector in IMF member countries. I'm not arguing that the ESRB should go all the way to conducting assessments equivalent to a fully fledged FSAP at the European level. But I do think and wish that it would be a good thing for the ESRB to take a few more steps in that uh, direction. Let me uh, also conclude uh, with a final, uh, final observation. Over the years, uh, it has become increasingly important to use the ESRB as a sounding board for other institutions. And one, one good example is when the European uh, Commission's 
asks the ESRB to opine on various new initiatives and various new uh, directives. So while the ESRB on the one hand only possesses soft tools, and maybe it's only also only partly because of that, it has become an important role. The ESRB has come to play an important role when it comes to helping other European institutions to get things done, when it comes to influencing decisions, when it comes to influencing the design of future uh, legislation, and all of this done under the umbrella of what is called uh, macroprudential uh, oversight. Thank you.